praise the Lord. I am so excited for all of our first-time visitors. Welcome to Bethel Gospel Assembly, Loving Learning Launching Church right here in Harlem. Amen, where we have two services going on almost at the same time. We have our Living Water Christian Center having service in the old sanctuary, our Connection Center. And here we are in the Destiny Worship Pavilion, worshiping God to all of you here for the first time. We welcome you from wherever you have come. Amen. And I'm excited today because we get to talk to someone and with somebody who we, we, we first of all, their roots go way back. <clears throat> Bethel's over 100 years old. And so in this Pentecostal movement that started in 1906 with this deeper revelation of the power of the Holy Spirit, amen, that we were born in the shadows of that in 1917 uh, formally, but began to come together just 10 years later, 1916. And at the same time, there was a movement that took place in the islands in Montserrat, and one of the early churches that were involved in that whole Pentecostal movement from the very beginning. This gentleman, his grandfather, his pastor of the church came right out of that, and they began a church ministry that our own first pastor, Pastor James Barzi, was a part of. And so this is where the link begins, all the way back in, in somewhere in the teens, 19, in the previous century. And then out of, from that grandfather came a father who also pastored, and then a son, a grandson, who played a very interesting role in the life of our second pastor, Bishop Ezra Nehemiah Williams, who upon sharing and spending some time with his father, this man of God who I'm about to bring up, they, he, he was in his library and found a book and was so impressed by that book and the person who wrote comments in the book that then in the 1960s, later on, when this man that we're about to present came to visit Bethel, the church of Barzi, so he came to visit Bethel, now Ezra Williams, the pastor, that when he stood up to greet and announce who he was, Bishop Williams made it sh his point to talk to him, invited him to spend some more days in New York and spend time with him and his wife and his family and spend a few days. Then afterwards, Bishop showed him a book which, which this gentleman looked at and said, wait, that's my book. How'd you get my book? And he, and he told him where he got it and told him how impressed he was with the comments that he wrote that he said, I wanted to look up close and personal at the man who wrote those kind of comments and see, did he truly live up to what he was writing? And indeed he did. And the interesting thing that, that this man of God said, well, what if I wasn't? What would you have done? And Bishop said, well, then I would have sat down and reminded you of what you wrote and tell you you need to live up to that. And a great relationship began all the way back there in the 60s. And he went on to speak for our missions conference. He did married couples, him and his lovely wife, Eve. And, and they'd done uh, Ujima when we started Urban Global Missions Alliance. He was the, the um, inaugural speaker for us and came and shared the word of God as we launched the Ujima organization in 1995, 1997. And, um, and then he went on to become my mentor while I was in, in um, seminary. He was my mentor. We connected and and from that point, we just had a special link that has lasted all these years. Now, for we have taken our leaders. We have, as a congregation, we have been down to Abundant Life Fellowship in New Jersey and a beautiful um, ministry that was established there. This man of God founded it in 1995. But not only that, but so many churches that he has founded over the years, um, pastored, moved on as God led him. He's a prophet, he's an apostle. Spent time with Peter C. Wagner, for those of you who are students of the word, and also Apostle Kelly, and helped to influence them in perfecting and, and speaking further into the office of the apostle, these leading apostles in the nation and the world. And um, he's had influence in their lives, and he's just been a blessing. But over and above that, he is a humble servant of God. A humble servant of God. So it's my pleasure to present to you all the way from New Jersey, where we will have what I call conversations with a servant. Conversations with a servant. I present to you and introduce to some of you the Apostle Abraham Fenton. Amen. Praise the Lord. 
Apostle, can you hear us? And you might have to correct some of the things I've said. I don't know, but um, there you are, and it's good to see you. We, you were supposed to be here. COVID came, and other things happened in your life, and also the recent passing of your wife, and so many things interrupted what we planned to do, but at least we're getting this done today, and welcome to Bethel Gospel Assembly. It's been a wonderful, wonderful journey, and you have captured it very well. Sometimes when I hear the introductions, then I almost want to hide my face, <laughs> uh, because the truth be told, all of the honor, all of the glory, and all of the praise goes to our Lord and our Savior, the King of Kings, and the Lord of Lords. Amen. I just don't have anything of myself to boast about, but he's been very kind, he's been very gracious and very faithful to me. And so I cherish every moment that I might have to honor him. And if he so desires to use me as a conduit through which he can bless and inspire and help any one of his children, that's my joy. And I'm just so happy for the relationship that we have had with uh, Bethel Gospel Assembly going back from generations and it still continues. It is just a real blessing and a real privilege. And uh, so here I am and uh, in whatever way I can, blessing to many, so let it be. And uh, I, I like the idea of a conversation because then we can go back and forth and hopefully those who are in the church have been watching the service and been inspired by it and I felt the thrust and the power of it, wish I were there, but um, we have a different method. And I'm glad that the Lord has raised up this technology so that I could be in one part of the country of the world and you be where you are and still be able to connect and communicate. So God be praised and I'm here at your disposal and whatever I can any question I can answer or any comment I can make and the Lord can use it, then I will be thrilled. Blessings to everybody. Just just full of joy today, just to be here with you. Amen. Praise the Lord. And and I should add that not only did he found a church, a beautiful large church down in New Jersey, but they also it's a church complex. They have housing similar to what we have here. There's housing but bigger housing uh, facilities and they do so many different things from their edifice and we thank God for Pastor Aubrey uh, who's the lead pastor now over there at, at, um, at Abundant Life Fellowship and, and a tremendous man of God and you'll be hearing more from him in the future but right now we want to get to the word of God now this comes out of so many conversations we have had over the years on usually on the phone and and out of it I have to s s just get quiet and start taking notes because it's like I'm back in seminary I'm learning and just from conversations and so many deep things from the word of God have been expressed. So this is what we're going to do right now. So this is, this is a teaching, preaching moment for you as we just let the spirit of God guide us. There are five principal questions that, that um, I came up with that I wanted to, uh, to, to cover. We probably won't cover them all. But, and we'll see where it goes. We might go into another direction. But this is an opportunity to study, to hear the word of God, and to grow. Amen. So are you all ready for this? You don't sound too encouraging. Are you ready? Yeah. Amen. So let's begin with the first, the first uh, question that I had. And I wanted us to get a little personal with the man of God and, and learn a little bit more about him. And so the first question really deals with this idea of what was the most remarkable experience in your life that you would say really helped to solidify or bring you into the relationship with Jesus Christ? Well, that's a very powerful question. The most uh, remarkable experience. Uh, you gave a while ago a little synopsis of how the Pentecostal movement began in Montserrat in about 1907 with my grandfather and his father, and how Elder Bazi was there as well. And out of that came a great movement. In fact, 
the whole fellowship, the Pentecostal assemblies of the West Indies, that have sent missionaries and ministers all around the world. They actually came out of that. Problem is that as I grew up as a teenager and I began studying to go to school, I always had questions, always was curious to understand everything, everything around me. But I could not understand a lot of things and some of the contradictions that I saw in religion and in life, they puzzled me. And the bottom line is by the time I was in my mid-teens, I had lost faith in God, faith in heaven, anything supernatural. And uh, shamefully, I, I was an admitted atheist in, in the grammar school. And, some of the people in the church were very troubled. They said they would never allow any of their children to go to that school because they had choose the school of turning me into an atheist. But there was something happening in all of that. The first thing was that uh, I had an insatiable appetite for what is true, what is real. I needed what was real, whether it was in religion, whether it is in science or in any arena of life, it was what was real that really attracted me. So I did not know at the time that a search for truth is actually a search for God. All I know is very, very miserable because life seemed very, very absurd. It doesn't, didn't seem to have a meaning. There were some of the French philosophers I used to read, and they expressed the thoughts that I had that uh, all of this human existence was an absurdity because we couldn't figure out the reason for it and the whys of it and so forth. But as God would have it, after I had uh, written my final examinations for the university, and I was waiting for the result. One Saturday, a friend told me that there was a service being held in a village in Bonsford called Conkhill. And when he said it to me, for some reason, I had an insatiable yearning to be at that meeting. I never could explain it. It seemed like it was a hook in my innards, and I had to be there. So I went to the service, the Sunday night in Conkhill. And there was a man, I should remember his name, although it was more than 60 years ago. His name was Pat Kelly. And while he was preaching, and he seemed to be under an extraordinary morning, I had a sensation as if I had been surrounded by feelings of fire. Now, it was not painful. It wasn't even not pleasant. But it was very, very real and very powerful, and it was swirling out all around me. And I started to be the left, and I looked to the right, and I looked around, and I didn't see anybody seem to be disconcerted. They, they didn't seem to be experiencing anything, but I was experiencing this, this swirling things of fire. So I said, my God, what's this? And I said it, out of that swirling fire, a voice spoke to me and said, this is the Holy Spirit fitting you and preparing you for service. So I said, well, if that be the case, let the preacher come down from the platform and put his hand on my forehead as a sign. And as I said that, the preacher stopped preaching, scanned the congregation, and his eyes focused on me, and he literally ran down from the platform and came to where I was in front of me and put his forehead in his hand upon my forehead. He didn't say anything, but he turned around and went back to the platform to finish his preaching. And when he did that, I slumped forward to the pew that was in front of me. And for the next 15 minutes or so, I really can't tell you what happened. It seemed like I was in another world. Uh, maybe that was being slain in the spirit, I really don't know. It seemed like it was about 50 minutes and I could not, uh, I, I just didn't know what happened there, but something was going on. When I came to and sat 
Saturday and began to focus on, on, the, on the meeting still, something has happened. Because to my left and near the platform was a door. And then I saw as if there was a person coming through the door. And as it came to the door, it was covered with a white robe. This white robe fell from the shoulders down to about nine inches off the floor. It had a pattern, it was white on white, almost with the letter Z crisscrossing the folds of his garment. But I couldn't see his face, I couldn't see his hands, and I couldn't see his feet. So when I saw his feet come to the door and head towards the platform, I was dumbfounded. And I said, oh, I am hallucinating. And that's what hallucination is like. And I can think, I am hallucinating, I'm having a hallucination. My mind went back to Lady Macbeth <laughs> in Shakespeare's drama, and how she had a hallucination. That's why I first had the word. And I said, so that's what it's like. And I, I'm feeling that. Then this thing went behind the preacher, went right to the wall. But as it came alongside the preacher, he stopped preaching and began to follow it in his eyes. And when he went to the door, he turned around to the congregation and he said, Did anybody see that angel? And when he said that, a silence hit the congregation. Nobody spoke, nobody answered. I wanted to answer, but I couldn't talk. I was absolutely thunderstruck. So he finished his sermon, and then there was a lady from the choir. <clears throat> I actually remember her name, it was Sister Kubo. And she stood up on the choir, and she waved her hand, and she said, concerning what the brother said about the angel, and I didn't give her a chance to finish. I jumped to my feet and I showed it to the top of my voice. Me too! <laughs> Very different ones began to say, they saw a light come to the door and went behind the preacher to the wall. And about 49 different people said they saw something, some varying levels of detail. But that's what happened. God gave me what I call a burning bush experience, a burning bush Counter. My eyes saw, my ears heard, my body felt, and so it's like the Apostle John said, that which my eyes have seen, which my ears have heard, which my hands have handled of the word of life, that's what I'm declaring with you. We didn't quite enter there. I went back to the place I was staying and I slept. I thought I slept, but I really didn't. I felt like I was suspended amongst the stars and being turned and churned all night, being made from what I was to something else. And the next morning, I got the bus and went back home. I opened the door. My father was putting some letters together to send them to the post, post office. And as I opened the door, I said to him, good morning. And he looked at me, and he groaned, but he didn't answer. Well, a few months later, he said, do you remember when you came that morning and you opened the door and you said good morning? I said, yes. He said, well, when you said good morning, I was struck by such a wave of the Holy Spirit that I couldn't see. I was speechless. So I said to myself, I don't know where my son was last night, but one day I know where every was in that God. And that was how the Lord started with me. That was the beginning. But it didn't end there. There were many, many other experiences and episodes where God took it upon himself to find an insignificant little man in a small island of Marshall and give to me what I have turned over the years, a burning bush encounter that transformed my life, changed me from the inside to the outside. And from that day to this day, it has left a fire burning inside, a transformation that keeps on transforming. And uh, a sense of his presence, 
and a sense of his purpose and a sense of his calling that cannot be negotiated and is never up for sale, not up for negotiation. And all I wanted to be is to be his servant. Under any circumstances that he would determine or desire, anywhere, and in fact, we began to sing, I'll go where you want me to go, dear Lord, over the mountains, over the plains, over the sea. I'll say what you want me to say, dear Lord. I will be what you want me to be. And that's been, in so many ways, the story of my life. There's so much more to that I can add because that was just the beginning, but it was not the end. And from time to time, when I needed him to come and give me additional reassurances, he was faithful to do so. And so all praise, all honor, all glory and majesty, my heart overflows with thanksgiving. And maybe they, I can't see you, but maybe you can rejoice with me for what God did for just a little fellow from the island of Montserrat. So small, it wasn't even on the map, but God was still good enough to me to find me and to do what he did so that I can be a blessing to his people. Well, certainly. So that, my limited answer to that question. Well, let's praise the Lord for that. And so I want to I wanna stay there for a little bit and with another yes. question. Now, the good thing is that the word, you, you became a witness, the Latin word testis, when you talk about testimony and sharing that testimony. And it certainly yes. says to us in uh, Psalm 66, 16, Come and hear all you who fear God, and I will tell you what he has done for my soul. And you've done that here. And I think what's important, and, and I want you to break this down a little bit, you had this dynamic experience, this, as you said, this little fellow in this place that's not even on the map at the time. And from there, you've gone around the world, you, you preached to hundreds of thousands, and, and literally th hundreds of thousands probably have come to the Lord underneath your ministry. You take, um, but that's your experience. Why you and why are so many people lacking that same level of revelation of God in such a supernatural way? How can those who are sitting here who have not even come to know the Lord, is that what they should expect? What goes along with that kind of, of experience? And, and then how should one um, uh, measure their own experience? I'm saved today, but I didn't have that kind of dynamic experience, but the Lord came to me. How can you break that down for us? Well, it's really a very good question and one that I have asked myself many times. And uh, my best answer to that is that God's revelation to you is directly linked to his purposes for you. And uh, so there was only one Moses. And uh, nobody else has had the encounter that Moses had. But Moses' encounter was the encounter that Moses needed in order for Moses to be transformed from what Moses was to becoming the vessel and the instrument that God wanted Moses to be. And so the way that God deals with you is directly linked to God's purposes for you and for the things he wants to accomplish through you. And, and, and that's my best answer to that. So there are others who don't need that kind of revelation. Now, for example, my wife, she's gone on to be with the Lord two years ago, and she had her own encounters, but she seemed to literally be born with faith. I don't understand that kind of faith. People who may have not seen God work in these astounding ways, they haven't seen the eyes of the blind, open the ears of the deaf and stop. But nothing can shake your faith. I said, I wish I had that kind of faith. But however, God took me through the experience because of uh, what he wanted me to be and to do. And one of those things, I didn't understand any of this for many years. I didn't. In fact, when people began to say you're an apostle, I said, oh, of course not. There's no such thing as an apostle these days. But I began to notice that when God wanted to bring about uh, a significant change in a given area, place, or context that for some reason he would have me there. And then a change would happen. Something would go through that congregation or through that locality that would change its trajectory. 
from what it was to something else. And people began to uh, make remarks to say, you know, uh, things have been so different since you've come here. And then I began to ask myself, is it coincidental? Did it just change when I got there? Or did my going there have something to do with change? Catalyst, yeah. So I did not realize for many years the kind of anointing that I had and the work for which I was called and uh, how God had chosen to deal with me. But there are many people who have been blessed by this testimony and hearing it was sufficient to give them faith. But it's a lot more than that, but maybe I can stop it for the time. Well, we appreciate that. And, and I know you don't like a whole lot of, you're very humble and certain things came up in our conversations. I challenged you once about this idea of the apostleship and challenged you, but I asked you questions and you were able to define it and talked about that meeting with John Kelly and, and, and C, uh, uh, Peter C. Wagner, and uh, who were some of the leading um, individuals in this whole apostolic move and how they first rejected some of what you were saying, but then after a while they turned around and said, wait, you're right, and, and the concepts. And the influence you had, now you never went around boasting about who you talked to and who you're with, but the uh -huh. fact is that, and what I want to point out is to who much is given, much is required. And God gave a great deal of revelation to you because he could trust you with humility. You know, I'm going to share with the congregation. You don't talk about it, but the fact that back when everyone was hearing about Fred Price and, every, and all the televangelist movement, that you were sitting at the table and they were asking you and say, we're ready to push you, we're ready to produce you, and you're supposed to be right there alongside of these other men of God. And the Lord told you, don't take that assignment. You said, no, tell them no. They thought you were crazy. How could you turn this thing down? And you could be a worldwide, everyone can know who Abraham Fenton is, and you said no. In spite of the reality and the revelation God gave you, you handled it in a humble manner and said, that's not what God wants. God wants to use me in a different way, and you were able to handle that. And so I just wanted to make note of that, of so more can understand just who we're talking with. But here's the thing I want to ask you. Now, you had this dynamic experience. So how should others who did not have that dynamic experience, and you shared about your wife Eve and, and her faith, how do we, how do we, how do you advise our audience to deal with their own reality of God, how God brought them to the faith, and should they limit in their minds what God wants them to do? Well, Abraham Fenton had this tremendous experience, so he's supposed to do tremendous things. Are we to say that the things that God has us to do might be lesser because we didn't have such a dynamic experience? We have to be very careful when we start thinking of a greater and lesser, because in the kingdom of God, <laughs> um, it's, those rankings don't work in the kingdom of God. Uh, it's 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 said who will be the greatest amongst you? He is a servant of all, and we have an inverted process of ranking in our world system. But in the in, in the kingdom of God. He who humbles himself is the one that will be exalted. And if you're little in your own eyes, then God could use you. But once you begin to become inflated in your own self importance, that is a shortcut to disaster. And uh, so happy is the man, happy is the woman, who, in spite of all that God has done in your life, that you can still remain humble in God's presence because God resists the proud. Uh, but he gives grace to the humble. Uh, and uh, so it's very important to stay grounded. But the other thing is that when you come to God, and, you, and I like the, the motto of, of Bethel, it's the loving, learning, launching, what's the last And thing? liberating, and liberating. liberating. Yes, well, that loving and learning, that's the special of learning. Jesus is coming to me and learn of me. And, and you shall find rest of your souls. So, that's part of his invitation. We are supposed to come to him and learn. But one of the things that learning from Jesus will do, it will induce humility. Because the more you learn of God, and the more you learn from him, is the more you recognize there is to know. It's like a pyramid hidden in the ground. And you scratch the ground, you find the tip of the pyramid, and you're excited by what you have found. He said, let me dig some more. So you start digging down, digging down. But the more you uncover is the larger it gets. 
And so the more you know of God, is the more you recognize there is to know of God. And happy is the man who recognizes that, or the woman for that matter. And we don't get caught up in our own self-importance that I, I have studied so well, I have had this amount of revelation and all the rest of that. Now it will induce humility. So one of the things I said to some of my students, until intellectual humility has been induced, one has not learned enough. And uh, I, I, I just leave it at that. But, you know, the Lord will give to you, and I'm confident of this, that he will give to every person sitting in this church right now, and every person who's listening to me, he will give to you the measure of revelation and encounter that he determines is appropriate to his purpose to you. Now, this is sometimes we 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 sometimes even ask questions. I was going to say the wrong question, I'm not sure it's such because the wrong question. But in many situations, we, we we are very focused on what we should be doing for the Lord, what our ministry should be, and, and that's okay. But if we understand what God's what his project is. And I think sometimes this is where the church has a difficulty in not focusing adequately on what the project that God is working on. What is the product of all this enormous engineering of the universe, putting the galaxies and the stars, creating and designing Earth the way he did, then introducing human beings into the earth, it's a project that he's working on. And we need to have a better understanding of that project. So as we understand the project, we also understand his purpose. But when we understand his purpose and his project, we'll also understand his process. Mm -hmm. and, and so we go from purpose to process to project. And, and so God has a purpose, he has a process, and he has a product. But when we get a better understanding of the product, we understand that the process is better. And we are more at peace with the process. So let me maybe just elaborate a little bit. What, what, what God is really working on here, he is producing a new order of intelligent beings. Uh, the apostle said, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. All things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Everybody, I believe, is familiar with that. He also said, for example, in Romans 8, 28, I think, he said, we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. And then he, and when you get to that, most people stop there. But we should read the verse after that, mm -hmm. which elaborates on the purpose. Because the next verse says, for whom he did foreknow, he did predestine to be conformed to the image of his son, that he, the son, may be the firstborn of many brethren. Now, that's a mind-blowing statement if you've ever read one or come across one in all that you've ever read. Because you break it down and he's saying that the purpose of God, he's taking those who love him and those who have called upon his purpose, and he is designing a pathway for them that will transform them from what they were when he called them and started their journey, he will transform them. And when the finished product is done, then the likeness of Jesus. In fact, he said, Jesus will be the firstborn of many brethren. That statement blows my mind. That whatever God is working on, Jesus is a prototype. Mm -hmm. It's right. shocking, it's astonishing, it's amazing, exciting. Uh, it, 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 it charges the mind and the soul and the spirit to know that, you know, sun, moon, stars, Mars, Jupiter, all of that. They were not created in vain. Earth was put here 
as a factory in which God was producing a new gene, a new order of beings, a new order of beings that he could legitimately call sons of the highest or daughters of the highest, sons of the kingdom, children of light. It's a new generation. And when the when that project is completed to his satisfaction, then there will be the unfolding, the revelation, uh, as Paul says, the whole universe is groaning in travail, waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God, waiting for the unfolding of this thing. So this is really what's going on. And so whatever is required to take Bishop Brown, Abraham Fenton, or Sister Joan, or whoever might be the person, to go from what we were before he apprehended us, and to take us through the journey of conforming, so that when the time has come, he can present us before the Father and say, they have come through great tribulation. They have which stood every fiery dart that the adversary has hurled against them. They have borne all the pain, the suffering, the stress, the trials, the tribulation. And withstanding all of that, notwithstanding all of that, they still love me. They still love what I love. They still prefer what I prefer. Come on. My agenda is their agenda. I am the person that they love. And so we are here in this factory of evil. And it is a critical. The process requires us to be exposed to the level of stress and strain and persecution and trial that the devil can hurl at us. Because just like a jewel comes out of the earth in its rough state, and then it goes to the water of washing, sometimes it's going to the fire of purification, the scraping and the acid bath and all that you do that so you get a finished product. It's, it's tough, but the outcome is, is stupendous. It's, it's, uh, it's awesome, it defies imagination, but it's literally, uh, it, it fills you with the sense of, a overflowing joy to know that you've been called and given a chance to qualify. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. I, Psalm 71 55 says, My mouth will tell of your righteous acts, of your deeds of salvation all the day. And I think what it comes down to, even as you spoke about your beginnings, everybody has a significant beginning because, as you said, in this factory of evil, it did something to us. But when we come through to the point that we're still talking Jesus, still holding on, in spite of the stuff that's been going on in our lives, past, present, and even future, but yet we're holding on, being processed in order to fulfill his purpose, it comes down to our willingness. We all have something to say. We might not see angels like, you saw, like you've seen. We not, might not have that experience. But we know what it took for us to come to say yes to the Lord. And that's the word that somebody needs to hear. And so we all have a glorious beginning that we can share about how we came to the faith. And so Amen. praise the Lord. And sometimes I think that they're better than me because I was so badly off, I needed more. <laughs> I hear what you say. I hear what you say. You don't need, you don't need what I needed when I was in, in the battle. But let me just add a little thing here. Because sometimes people hear our testimony. And the thing that our life was just a, a life of um, a, an easy life. It has not been. I've been through a lot. And there were times when I was shaken to the very foundations. Whatever God saved you from, the enemy will try to bring you back there. And there were times when, had it not been for that encounter, sadly saying, because of the struggles and the persecutions and the hardships and the fiery furnaces that we've had to go through navigating life. There are times that I think I would have given up again if I was just, if I had just been 
intellectually convinced into it, I might have given up again. Let me stop but you, God, right there. Apostle. Let yes. me stop you right there because this is beautiful. You really went into the second question, and we want. I'm, we're probably going to hit the third one. I want to hit the third one, but the second okay. one, and you kind of covered it. And, and you're saying it now because the question for everybody was, and you have it in front of you, what were the key factors that kept you grounded in Christ in your most difficult seasons? And, and certainly James 1, 2 to 5 really talks about what we're supposed to do with those seasons. But in the interest of time, I, can you share, you just said a mouthful that there have been times in spite of everything that God has revealed through you and then of all the mountains that you have climbed and all the success you've had in over 60 plus years of ministry and then to, and to be very transparent and say that, can you tell us in transparency of, of a one, one or two situations where it's like, okay, this is, I don't know if I can handle this, but yet God brought you through. Can you share one of them with us? Well, Bishop, I, I, I will tell you this, that after the Lord saved me and he began to use me, I, I, I really wanted to be smart because I used to hear how the Lord, you will go through all these things and I didn't want to go through any of them. So I made up my mind, I was going to be as righteous as I can get. I'm going to be, I walk before the Lord, I'll be perfect. He wouldn't have any need to take me through all of that. <laughs> it didn't work. I really saying it did not work. It did not. And uh, so uh, um, like I, I'll say this and then I'll back up a little bit. Because when he, he, I always say he tricked me into coming to live in the United States because I had it pretty good where I was. And he sent us here, he said, go and as you go, promote love, unity, and evangelism in that order. And I came to the United States. But for most of my life before that, he always told me what to do. But when I came to the United States proper to live and to minister, he stopped talking. And I mean, I would pray, there is no word from the Lord. I will go through this issue, no word from the Lord. I'm reading the Bible, I'm praying, but he isn't talking. And uh, at one time, some of the people that I expected to be helping, they turned around and they became uh, adversaries. And, and they, they, they spread false rumors. They, they threatened people who would help me, that if they helped, me that they would lose their collaboration and we end up being here almost my family myself just on the open the open seas almost so one day when things were really really bad I was driving the freeway and there was a I felt like there was a question deep inside of me that I need to answer for myself I need to answer the question but I was afraid of the question. I tried to suppress it. I didn't, want to, I didn't want to face it. So one day I felt I'm going to have to face the question. And I literally was in my car and I said, okay. And then the question from my subconscious, where it came from, the question was, if you knew for sure that there was no God, no heaven, no hell, no devil, no nothing. What kind of man would you want to be? I said, oh, I would still be a man who loved truth. I'd still be one who loved justice. I would still be a man who loved integrity. And I'm going down the line. That's to answer myself being just facing myself to see who I am. What was inside. And to my shock. As I was saying that, that little voice spoke up again. So you see, you do love me because that is what I am. And I almost trembled in the car because I had come to a point of self understanding that I knew who I was and the, and, and the Lord was confirming that. Now, what were some of those things? Let me go back to when I actually went to the Bible school as a young man in the Bible school. Uh, I, I was naive in a lot of things because I said, imagine this. 
I am going to a school where every student is studying how to be a minister of the gospel. This is a big deal. I'm not going to be there amongst any sinners. And the teachers will be teaching us how to be men and women of God. I say, I am going next door to heaven. And that's what I thought. <laughs> I, 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 that's what I was 21 years of age. I was excited about God. I figured I'm going next door to heaven. I didn't want to go to Cambridge or Oxford or nothing. I wanted to go to school where people, that God was everything. They were teaching God. They were, huh? Well, I can tell you that one night there was a chap. He was from one of the islands. And he got on my nerves. He got on my nerve. He wouldn't stop. He wouldn't stop provoking me in the dorm until on my bunk, I started to shake. I was so angry. And eventually the dorm got quiet and I got off my bunk and I was heading for his room and I was up to no good. But as I was approaching his room, it was like a and a, a, a light began to flash inside of me. The wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. The wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. On and on. And it began to work in my spirit. And instead of going into his room to fight, I went straight out of the dorm and went out on the grounds, cold evening, uh, and, and sat on a rock under the moonlight. Took me three hours to cool off. For the next three days, I had a sour stomach, and I learned you can get so angry, sends hydrochloric acid into your, into your stomach. It took me three days to get rid of that. But if I had done there what I set out to do, you would have never heard of me, because they would have thrown me out of school, and I would have been derailed. But you see, when I started that journey, and every believer should do this, you should feed on the word of God. I, I mean, study, memorize it. I know some people think that it's old fashioned to memorize. Listen to me, this first Psalm, Psalm 119, where was thou shall a young man cleanse his way by taking heed thereto according to thy word. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. You know, the law of the Lord is perfect, converting or transforming the soul. I had all these things all the way because the word there. And then the Holy Spirit was there to ignite that word and to bring to the forefront of my mind in a crisis moment in which my whole life and ministry would have been derailed to bring it there and to save me from myself. And that was the easy part. Because after that, as the Lord began to bless our lives, I, I thought that when the Lord bless you and use you, that people would love you. And some people did. But like Saul who got jealous of David, the headman got very troubled and he persecuted me without a cause. And so God delivered me from that. And over the years, I can't take the time. We don't have the time to elaborate on some of them. But uh, even in the ministry that we have here, when the Lord led us to acquire this place, I thought that we would be welcomed in the township, but they persecuted us. I mean, they persecuted us. Uh, and uh, it, 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 was, it was terrible. But I had said to my congregation, I am teaching you on understanding God's kingdom. Because what began to unfold for me years before is that when Jesus taught on the kingdom, for example, and he said, anyone hears the word of the kingdom doesn't understand it. The devil takes what it has. I'm also teaching you the kingdom because for, to him who has, more will be given. And from him who does not have, even what he has will be taken. And I began to recognize that Jesus spent three years trying to get us to understand the system by which he governs and controls everything that he's made. Uh, most Christians want to relate to God, but not his system of management. They want to relate to Jesus, the Savior, but not to his system. 
Jesus is saying, you know me, but I need you to understand the system that I made and how it works. I have made it up. I call sometimes, I call them kingdom algorithms that if you do this, the, 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 those laws are programmed and designed to do that. If, you, if there's a level of having, that if you're below that level of having, you will tend to decrease. If you're at that level or above, you will tend to increase. I made the law. I sustained that law. Anybody, rich or poor, white or black, um, whoever, saved or unsaved, if you use the laws of aerodynamics, they will work for the saved and for the unsaved. I couldn't find out in, in any writings how to name some of these laws. So I did put a name on that law. I call it the law of the acceptable minimum. And so for a believer, sometimes some of the stresses we are going through is that we are below the law of the acceptable minimum. We are below the law of, in money, in education, in associations, we, we, we below the level that we should have. And so we are in a losing posture. It's a kingdom law. And so you can love Jesus, but still be on the wrong side of the law. It's perhaps the most uh, astounding discovery that I made that the Lord led me into and, uh, and which I have used to, to, to share with a lot of people how not to be under the penalty of that law. So you can be saved, but still being penalized by the law, of the, uh, the, by the, the system. So you don't want to be penalized by the law of the system. And so uh, there's just a lot of that. These are sort of things I took 18 months to teach a class. That, so I'm not going to do it in, in a few minutes. But just drop in that nutshell there. But what the Lord used a lot to help me in those moments is that when nothing else would work, I would go and see what kingdom law is at stake here. And I will invoke the kingdom law and follow what the kingdom law is. And it has been amazing how the Lord has taken us from the jaws of the feet um, to the mountaintops of victory. And instead of being persecuted in our township, our work is celebrated in our township because the Lord decided that he'll make the stone which the builders rejected, he's made it the headstone of the corner. So... I don't know if that answers any of your questions. <laughs> well, you did. And, and the thing is, the Bible says that they overcame by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. The word of the testimony is the word of God. And you, you began with that, that how we are to navigate and how we are to remain grounded is by being rooted. Rooted where? In the word of God. And that's what we, we oftentimes feel we know enough word. We, we know the principal scriptures. But when you talked about understanding the kingdom principles and we we're going to roll back another time and get into that because we've had discussions on that and it was deep I got my notes on it but it'd be nice for them to hear from you rather than me but the point is that when we get into this and there are books that write about it but you took it to another level and so it's about understanding the word of God which is what we've been preaching what we've been talking about is what our Christian education ministry has been emphasizing has been growing under uh, Pastor Zelda and, um, and, and it's the, the word and we're trying to get our congregation to understand you want to stand and be an Abraham Fenton well it's not just because you had this dynamic experience to get started but how you begin to cultivate it through the word of God out of the love of God the word of God and seeing the fruit that comes from being grounded. And I also would say that for some of us, we, 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 we sometimes look at ourselves and want to give ourselves an F. And the fact is, God says, no, don't give yourself an F. Yet, you, didn't, you, you, you struggled in those areas, but that's part of the process, and that's what you're talking about, that it was supposed to take you completely out. It did not. Why? Because you have been rooted, a measure of rooting in the word of God, and there's still more to come. So stop looking at what you don't have. Begin to be, believe and understand what is to come and what you do have and how to build on that. Don't bury it. We talk about uh, that minimal, the, the law of minimalization that you're talking about in terms of the, uh, the, the steward. That, um, and that's where I want to end with it, the stewardship is, is how he buried what the little he had, he buried it, and he lost it. And you lose it when you bury it, but when you work it, when you understand, when you go deeper in the word, then you're able to 
withstand even when you don't understand. And it all comes, it's not magic, it is the word. It's not just a yes. touch of the Holy Ghost and speaking in tongues. It is the measure to which you, you now own the word of God that keeps you from, we become like the palm trees. Uh, instead of breaking like the oak, we can sometimes find ourselves bending, but not broken. And that's the Amen. key. And so, so um, you really answered that. In the last area, as, as time's just about gone for this, are we enjoying this? Are we getting something out of this? Praise God. Because Praise past, God. Uh, the apostle and I talked about a part two at some point, so we, we'll roll back at a part two and do it at another time. But I want to finish with, ah, we were going to talk about healing. You tell me which one you want to talk about, stewardship or healing, which one you want to, and we're going to close <laughs> with that one. That is the real question. Uh, maybe what I'm going to say now might touch on them both. Uh, remember I said I, I was really always after what is true uh -huh. and I'm ready at any time to be corrected and to be upgraded in my theology and my thinking at any time. But one of the things, sometimes I've wanted to find out, where did the church go wrong? Why is it that a lot that we yearn for and we think is legitimately ours, why don't we see? And uh, there are several, several missteps historically over the, the centuries. But one of them, we kind of slipped into a mode where we celebrate the word as opposed to doing the word. And uh, so people rejoice over the word, they celebrate it. Not that we shouldn't celebrate it, but Again, you go back to Jesus. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom, but he who does the will. And now, like in Matthew 7, he says, <clears throat> everyone who hears these words of mine and does them is going to be like uh, 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 a man who built his house upon a rock. And the rains came and the winds blew and the floods came and the house stood firm. But if you hear them and you don't do them, then, uh, then it's like a, a foolish man who built his house on the sand and the, 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 the floods came, the wind blew and the rains came and the house was destroyed. So it's really in the doing of the word. Unfortunately, many, many years ago, they became a theological tension in much of the church. You know, it's been a long time ago where there's an attempt to separate the doing from the believing. Sometimes they call it faith versus works. That should never have been an argument. But Jesus does not put a dichotomy between doing the word and believing the word. Just like a coin is not negotiable if it is blank on one side. So our faith without the action is also is blank on one side. So the all is is the doing, the doing of the word. So uh, for, for Christians uh, uh, around the world, we need to take a second look. And whenever we find the scriptures, I say this, for example, like loving. How, uh, we are a church of loving. We should ask the question now, like, why do we love? Answer that question, whom shall we love? And how shall we love? And to the best of your ability, start doing, start small, but then code large, just wherever you can, by doing the word. It will transform you. I know, for example, we've been through a pandemic. This was tough. My wife died in February, pandemic started in March. I couldn't get out in order to do anything to overcome the grief and all the rest of trouble. But you know, what part of what carried me through this was the fact that I, there was a, some verses of the proverb that says, um, what it says, let not kindness and truth forsake you. Um, write them on your forehead, bind them on the tablet of your heart. And so shall you find favor and uh, a good reputation in the eyes of God and man. So each morning I would get up and I said, Okay, I'm going to do an act of kindness to myself first, and then I'm going to find somebody else to do an act of kindness for. And that carried me through many, many months, just letting that be the first thing in the morning. So bottom line, I'm just trying to say, 
that if we do the word to the level of our understanding, when we do what we understand, it opens up us, opens us up to understanding even more. So we will understand more. So for a, 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 a believer today, if I think the question had to do with our, what was the question again? Stewardship? Yes. Yes. Was, Is, uh, what, yes. <clears throat> I would say to any, any church member, for example, look at the mission of your church. Because when God calls a church into being, he has a reason why he called that specific body into being alongside other bodies. And the, the, the purpose of God, assuming that we have it right, you'd almost always find the area of specialization that that church is supposed to, um, to, to, to prioritize. And so a, 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 a member, as I'm part of a church, what is that mission? And how can I, how can I play my part? What can I do to advance that mission? knowing full well that as I do that, I myself am growing. So there are many things we can say, but I certainly don't want to, um, to overstep the time frame. Yeah, and then for the rest of the congregation, prepare a final word for us, Pastor, but, but if, what we, the full question is, what would a responsible member in good standing in the church look like and the answer to that, given the challenges facing the faith in the world today? And that's into consideration of the political and social unrest, the relaxation of laws regarding marijuana, the exposure of our young children to fluidity of gender, uh, 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 gen I said gender here, uh, gender identity, and et cetera. We know what's going on in Florida, and, and, and um, we know what's going on in terms of, 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 of the uh, Republican Party and their views. Um, what's happening as versus the Democrat and the liberal, more liberal views. And we all have these influences and our own opinions about it. And so what does a responsible member look like when we have so many different points of view in the church? Um, and how do we navigate and come into, a, into an agreement? And part of the answer, and I think this is something we want to hit again another time, but part of the answer is understanding what the perp when we align ourselves to Christ, and we say, here I am, and we have prayerfully heard, this is where I planted you, then there's a call to stand in unity behind the mission that God has given a church that's truly spirit-led, founded in the word of God, and identifying what does the word of God say beyond the many influences and the many opinions that begin to manifest among membership. How do we come together in unity? And so part of that answer we, we've already heard, and I think next time we'll get more into specifics on those other elements that we spoke on. But I would end that just before Pastor, uh, our apostle, gives us a final word. First Peter 4, 7 says this to us, that the end of all things is near. And we need to recognize that. What's happening in the world, therefore, the Bible says, be alert and a sober mind so that you may pray. And we just don't pray aimlessly. We pray for instructions and direction. And it continues in the 11th verse to say, if anyone speaks, they should do so as one who speaks the very words of God. If anyone serves, they should do so with the strength that God provides so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. And to him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Praise God. Praise, God. Praise the Lord. Could you give us a final word, Apostle, and, 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 and close us out with a word of prayer? Amen. <clears throat> for, I, I'm, I'm just thankful for the privilege of being here and uh, to join with you through this medium. Uh, my final words would be, today that we should always be reminded that God has a purpose that he's working on. He has an agenda and we are privileged. I always say I am privileged to be invited into that agenda of God as a candidate to be molded and made into the kind of person that God wants, 
not just the kind of person he wants on earth, but when earth has served its purpose and Jesus has present, uh, the new creation and he's going to populate it with the products that he has produced on earth, I absolutely want to be there. And I would encourage all my friends to make that <clears throat> same commitment that we want to be there uh, when the time does come. And as Peter said, the time is drawing close. All the signs around us really indicate that it is, it, it is so. So we need to be in harmony with God's purpose, his greater purpose. But it, we also need to be in harmony with his purpose for the local church. Now, Jesus said, I will build my church. Uh, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now, there are religious institutions and formations and agencies all across the nation and around the world. And for all practical purposes, it seems like the gates of hell are prevailing against the religious institutions. Let's not confuse that broader religious institutions with the church that Jesus said he is building. I don't build a church. Jesus builds a church. And he said the gates of hell shall not prevail. So I rest on that, that the gates of hell have not prevailed against the church. They are not prevailing against the church and they cannot and never will. Furthermore, it is written that Jesus shall see of the travail of his soul and he shall be satisfied. In Revelation, there will be an innumerable number which no one shall number. And they will wash their robes white. So Jesus is not going to fail. He's not failing. A lot of, we get confused by a lot of what we see in the church. And, and the church sometimes get trapped into, and here's what I mean. The adversary creates a problem and says, and he wounds someone who has no desire to be, a part of God's project. And when he wounds that person, the devil comes and says, if you were a real Christian, you would spend your time and your money uh, fixing that person. But that person has no desire to serve the Lord. They'll just take your time, take your money, and all the rest of that. But they have no intentions of turning to God. I am not going to tell you today what to do, but I think you draw the inference because the enemy will want to get two or three or four or five or a hundred for the price of one. No, your business is to be on the king's agenda. What good thing does God want me to be doing? And what good thing he does not want me to be doing? We should have some clarity of that so that somebody does not shame us into doing something because they're doing it or because it's a good thing to do. But you need to have an understanding and stand your ground on what good thing God wants you to do and what good thing God does not want you to do. Churches, legitimate churches, as agencies of God planted in specific localities, have a unique DNA of that church. And God will put other churches in other areas that have a complementary DNA. They will be overlapping. And he asks us to love one another, and he asks us to have unity, which we will not get into because... There is so much riding upon that love and that unity. But suffice it to say that when God puts us and plants us into a local body, we must remember that the church is not a toy. It's not the people's toy and it's not the pastor's plaything. And people play with the church. Uh, but it, the, 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 the issues are huge. They're stupendous. And we, we, are, we are privileged to be called of God and to have the spirit of the almighty dwelling within us and clothing us like a garment and changing us so that we look like regular people, but God looks upon us and he says, that's my son there and that's my daughter there. This is a candidate for my eternal purposes. Now, you're one of those. And you want to be in harmony, you know, with what the Lord is doing with that ministry. And if he's planted you there, be faithful. Be faithful in loving, faithful in supporting. And let me stop about supporting. The government has the power of coercion. They could force you to do things. The church has the power of persuasion. We can't force anybody to do anything. 
not even the right thing. The government needs to be supported and they will force you to support. But the work of the kingdom of God expressed to the church needs support and should not be starved of the resources required. Sometimes for God's local assembly to excel, it needs a lead pastor, it needs uh, X number of associates, it needs people who are gifted, trained, qualified, so that we can, for example, if God's calling upon you is to be in the ministry of government, that while you can go to the university and you can study um, governance and all the rest of it, and you can gain that knowledge and expertise like Moses got in Egypt. He was, he, Moses was, was knowledge. He, had, he was expert in all of the knowledge of the Egyptians, whether it's the art of governance, the art of the sciences, the art of the arts, he was there. But he lacked the anointing requisite to his, his role. So if God wants us to be in the ministry of civil authority and you get your education there at the school, the university, at the church, maybe that God has anointed somebody there to give you a kingdom orientation to law, a kingdom orientation to the formulation of a law, the kingdom orientation to the implementation of laws, a kingdom orientation to the following of the Lord. We have all these things. The church is rich. It is awesomely rich. But one of the strategies of the adversary is to starve it up. If I cannot, if I cannot kill it, I will starve it up. And, and, and whereas it requires half a dozen or a dozen competent experts in the things of the kingdom to bring a person to maturity, we are sometimes stuck with one person or one and a half. And so just a lack of resources is a military strategy that all militaries know that if you starve out the other side and it doesn't have the resources, sooner or later, it will have to surrender. Thank God the Church of Christ has not surrendered. We are not about to surrender. But let's not be part of those who withhold the resources um, that the church requires. Let's pray, talk with our leaders, and make sure that we are on the track of the mission that God has given to us and support it with all our strength and fervor because it's not just the church that is depending upon it. It's the community. It's the, um, even the art of governance. We had a president, for example, who called for unity in the United States. But he grew up in a church that didn't understand the biblical ingredients of unity. What if he had been brought up in a church that had researched it, that understood it, and could speak into that man's life? What contributes to unity and how it could be implemented, not only in an in ecclesiastical context, but it could be implemented in a non-ecclesiastic or even a governmental context. The church has people with that anointing upon them, with that calling. And sometimes they misunderstand it and think they should be preachers. And everybody says, oh, you're anointed, you should be a preacher. But no, some should be the president, some should be the governor, some should be the senators, some should be the airline pilots, some should be the researchers in the laboratory, framing the questions correctly in academia, because uh, our findings in academia tend to follow how a question is phrased. God wants people, his people there, so that we, we, we don't come short of any, any of these disciplines, but we're God's experts under him in all of those, in those arenas. And the local church, is God's preeminent device to help us to get there. And may Bethel we got, give God praise for all that Bethel has been for over a hundred years. But just let it be that the days going forward will be the most transformational in the history of this church from the leaders to everyone who follows Every man, every woman, every boy, every girl who participates and who is touched by the outreach 
of this ministry, it's laundering and it's liberating the various uh, emphases that God has put there. Lord, how I pray that there be such an explosion of revelation, such an explosion of understanding who you are and what you have delivered to the church, what you have delivered to those who give leadership, what you have delivered to those who are called to follow and be the mighty men and the mighty women and the people of that unique agency of your kingdom. May this Bethel become today and tomorrow even more of what you desired than its splendid past can testify to. And may the joy of the Lord explode in this house. Even those who don't understand it or even know why is this joy exploding within me. Oh Lord, let it begin. Yes, it has already begun. You're answering the prayers that say it's your spirit that we need. It's your presence. It's your anointing that we want. Oh Lord, by the power of the Almighty, by the power of the Spirit, come upon this church and reignite its fire and cause a mighty conflagration to explode in Bethel and Harlem and New York that will reach the city and all of the areas of the world where your servants have been dispersed and supported by this ministry. And let your joy overflow amongst your people. We pray for the gifts of the Spirit to be manifested, but even more so that your people may understand their calling and their role and have a fresh zeal, a fresh zeal, to rally around the leadership and hasten to fulfill your will. Touch the sick, touch the pastor's son and the men and the women who are in this congregation, who are present and those who are elsewhere. You know exactly what is needed. There's nothing hidden from you. Our eyes are upon you. Our faith is in you. Our trust is in you. And we say amen to whatever decision you make. Because you do all things well. Glory be to the Father. Glory to the Son. And glory to the blessed Holy Spirit. Blessed be the name of the Lord forever. Amen and amen. And amen. 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 Come on, can we all stand and give God some praise? Come on, lift our voices up and let's say thank you, Lord, as the worship team comes back. Pastor, we thank you so much for your investment in this congregation. And we have been made rich by your wisdom, by your experience, and the best is still to come. And we return unto you, Lord, continue to strengthen this servant of God. Lord, even as our own daddy leader used to say, not retired, but refired. And even in this stage of ministry, the vision that this man of God has had for speaking words that will unify the church, that he'll continue to speak and be used as a man of wisdom with all humility, bringing about that transformation. Bless him, strengthen his body. And we give you all the praise for what you're doing in his life. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, sir. We'll be talking to you and sharing with you in a few minutes. Amen. And again, thank you for all that you've done and all that you Thank you for joining our worship service this morning. It is our sincere prayer that you were blessed and that you feel that your life was changed and impacted by your experience here. We look forward to worshiping with you again in the future. Should you need prayer, we as a church community are available to you. Feel free to reach out to us through any of the means on the screen below. And remember, we are Bethel Gospel Assembly, a loving, learning, launching, and liberating church located right here in the heart of Harlem. And we are here for you.